Good morning. And uh, welcome to, to today's discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, I am Chris Martin, Dean of the College of Business at Louisiana Tech University. And we're grateful that each of you have joined us for what I know is gonna be a, a thought provoking day. Today's forum marks the college's fourth year to host this event and to provide an opportunity for our students to have an important conversation uh, surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion in the context of business. In the College of Business, we strive to create a learning environment that considers and appreciates multiple perspectives. We consider this mindset critical to business success in today's global and inclusive workplace. Uh, special thanks uh, to each of our speakers who have graciously agreed to share their expertise, our expertise with us today. Uh, if you haven't signed up for our other sessions, please visit our website to register. There's still time to join the other sessions. Uh, now I'm pleased to introduce to you one of our very own alumni, Sean Gables. Sean Gables is the evening news anchor for CBS affiliate in Atlanta, who will serve as our moderator for this session. Sean is an Army veteran who earned her MBA from Louisiana Tech in 2019, and she has a deep history of working in journalism throughout the South. We are thrilled to have her with us today. So, Sean? I do consider it an honor. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate it. And we want to thank everyone for participating and leading the conversation on diversity and inclusion, a panel style discussion with some truly notable DEI thought leaders. It's an incredible way to start Black History Month, the beginning of February, and definitely a commitment to diversity and inclusion. We wanna start with some brief introductions and then I'll move into our questions for our panelists. I'm gonna start with Dr. Todd Jenkins. You see him with his bow tie on. Um, those of you who are familiar with him, he's known as Dr. Boto, Bowtie Todd. He is a founder and CEO of Bowtie Leadership and Development Incorporated. He serves as the Senior Director of Global DEI for Microsoft CBRE. He is a Certified Leadership Management International Facilitator, Coach and Speaker with more than 10 years of training and development, leadership development and diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Our next panelist is Steven Johnson. He's the Global Director for Culture, Diversity and Inclusion for Lowe's Companies. He is a global DEI leader with experience in corporate, educational, and nonprofit organizations, including time as a senior manager of inclusion and diversity for American Airlines. Finally, Brad Bomell serves as the global head of the LGBT and affairs at JP Morgan Chase. He brings more than 30 years of experience to the role, previously leading several large scale transformative programs and global teams for JP Morgan Chase and global finance, asset wealth management, and consumer and community banking. He is the founding member and a prior leader of the Open Finance New NYC. That's a nonprofit LGBT network for the financial service industry. I do wanna mention on behalf of all of our panelists that the comments that they make today are a reflection of their personal beliefs and not of the organization they represent. So let's begin with the first question. Everyone ready? We look so, all heads are nodding. Okay, I'm gonna start with, just feel free to answer the first question to all of our panelists here. What outcomes has your organization realized from diversity initiatives or best practices? I could start. Um, oh, sorry, Stephen. <laughs> uh, Brad Baumel, uh, JP Morgan Chase. So uh, I probably should start with like, I did also go to business school and I studied technology and finance and wow, I wound up at JP Morgan Chase uh, spending 30 years here now. So I, I have a deep affiliation for everybody that's on the call today. Um, I spent the majority of my career in technology, but always in the background, I did something in our people agenda. DENI was always part of my bread and butter personally. And so thankfully, it's been part of JP Morgan Chase's operating model since, I mean, decades now. So for me, um, DENI has always grounded me. It's always been a passion of mine, and I've always included it in my job. I highly recommend no matter what job you go to, 
make it part of your job, make it a side job, even if it's not part of your core job, because the key outcomes the firm and yourself personally, you get from it, certainly stronger representation. So the more diverse your teams are, the more creative and innovative they're going to be, the more they're going to be able to relate and interact with your client base and your customers, because they will represent the customers that you're serving. Your employees and yourself will have a sense of belonging. And that's often difficult in a number of organizations where people feel that they're different and don't belong because they're not represented in the corporate culture and employee base. That then leads to true authenticity, being able to bring your whole self to the table every day. And from that, be able to really advance and thrive in your professional endeavors. And that then is going to have an outcome on your own engagement and the engagement of others around you. So at J.B. Morgan Chase, we've truly operationalized diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is embedded in our core business practices and policies. And while, and this is something I think all organizations should do, we do have a dedicated focus around it with seven core centers of excellence. It is embedded in the businesses that run our, that run our teams, that sell our products, that interface with our customers. So while there is a dedicated focus to it, it is also part of everyone's job. And because of that, we connect better with our clients. The business itself will thrive. Um, we work to make diversity, equity, and inclusion integral and central to everything that we do. And everyone benefits from it, from employee to corporation to client. And Stephen, I know you were going to chime in next. Let's ask you from your vantage point from working for Lowe's. Yeah, no, absolutely, Sean. So, you know, one of the things that I've learned in, in my professional career and, you know, since I've been at Lowe's is that, you know, this work, um, it ebbs and flows, right? And, you know, there, there, there are parts of this work that you can be prescriptive in. And that's the part that most practitioners like to operate because you you can get out in front of, of, of stories before they blow up and you can talk and educate and create the safe environments that we want all of our employees to be a part of. Um, and then there are parts where, where things happen, right? And um, they're not prescriptive prescriptive and, and you you sort of get into this you know how do I how do I create a place that where damage was done or hurt was caused or something happened that goes against our core values right and so those things happen um, at, at various times right and you know I think especially since 2020 and the murder of George Floyd, there's been a lot of spotlight in this in this place, in this space that we've been in, which uh, has quite honestly, I'll speak for me, has been a double-edged sword, right? Lots of people uh, wanna check in and do the work with you and you're like, great, I got more I got more hands on deck to help with this. Um, but then there are more people in the kitchen, right? And you know, that old saying that, you know, uh, there are too many cooks in the kitchen and sometimes you have these competing priorities because everyone has found this, uh, this newfound passion uh, for this work. And so, um, you know, one of the, the big things for us, I think, or for for, for me, and then as we think about from an organizational standpoint, is how do we create consistency? And I think that's the big key thing out of, out of all of this work is how do you create a consistent experience from uh, one employee to the next, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera. And then that's, that's what we want to get on the outcome is that, that people enjoy where they, where they come to work every day. We spend so much time here, even if it's virtual. Um, I think that's you know, an, an added uh, perspective that uh, not only are you at work, but you're at home where you're teaching, where you are doing renovations, where you're doing all of these other things and work has to be now a part of of, um, of that space in a more intentional way. And so, um, you know, for us, I think it's, it's really about, you know, how do we create this consistency in a world that is ever changing and in a world that, that you know, creates unpredictable, as, as you so very well know, Sean, being in the news business, <laughs> very unpredictable uh, cycles of, of news and, and stories and coverage. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jenkins, we heard from Stephen how he said that, you know, creating those initiatives have somewhat been a challenge for you as the um, working at Microsoft and um, what has been the outcomes that you've realized from diversity initiatives and the best practices there? Yeah, so, you know, I, I've gotten the pleasure to work with so many different Fortune 500 companies and, you know, whether it's the Microsofts, the Walmarts, the CDREs of the world, you know, organization design um, is all with 
in, in, intertwined with human behavior. Um, and so when you think about the outputs and outcomes of what diversity, equity, and inclusion does for organizations, it really is a shift in culture, is a shift in talent, is a shift in marketplace, and it really brings a, a, a new level of, of engagement, awareness, but intentionality uh, that is part of an organization maturity index. And I think a lot of organizations are on the journey, um, as Stephen has said so graciously, as well as Brad, you know, it, it's, it's really evolving. Um, certain organizations are in different places, but we're all trying to head in the same directions. And, and I think another thing we have to say is that, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is not only the ownership within the workplace, right? It's an ecosystem approach. So it's systemic issues that happens in the communities of how people, you know, show up to work or the lack of opportunities. And, and I think the beauty of this as companies of our size, we have the responsibility, uh, we have the ownership to disrupt those systemic issues. And so when you think about true outcomes, I think about what are the outcomes we're putting to, uh, to really impact the systemic issues or the disparities in the ecosystem. And I think that's what happens in the workplace and outside the workplace. And I believe when you think about best practices, you're thinking that holistic approach um, not only what we do when our employees show up to work, but what is happening when they go home and do they feel safe? Do they feel seen and heard in the workplace and in the community? And as a, re as a result of that, of course, client facing, customer facing, you know, all of that is, you know, reflected into those strategies. Part of the beauty of having this open dialogue is to have frank and open conversation and we've invited um, those both on LinkedIn and on our social media platforms to be involved and to listen to this conversation. And one of the toughest things that I think I have seen as a professional working in a corporate environment is that the challenges you have with DEI initiatives when they're not warmly embraced by your organization and not necessarily the organization itself, but there are pockets of individuals who make up an organization where it's just tough because they've never been in the shoes that we've walked in. So it can be difficult to see from a different lens. What strategies do you use to get them on, on board? I'll start with you, Brad. So it starts at the top. Um, so if I look at J.P. Morgan Chase, for example, it's embedded in our code of conduct, our, our policies, our practices, our way of doing business. It's been acknowledged and communicated that it is everyone's responsibility. Everyone needs to feel, breathe, and operate in an inclusive way in a, in a culture of inclusion. Um, and, and that's been really instrumental to, to this journey. And, and I think, Sean, you were right, right? Everybody, depending on their location, their you know, culture, their background, is going to come to the table with a different perspective but everyone needs to feel like they're part of the solution and that they have to contribute towards it. So, you know, we've embedded DEI into the way we do business. It's part of our practices and principles. Our goal is to create an environment where people feel safe, that they feel like they belong, that they feel like they can contribute in ways that is that are personal to them that they're bringing their best ideas to the table and creating innovative solutions for our customers um, we've stressed and i think steven said this really well and it shouldn't take an event to get there like george floyd's murder back in 2020 but we've stressed the importance of listening right the the importance of being able to stand in someone else's shoes so that you can understand their lived experiences in a way that over time you can better represent them build allyship and advocacy over time so we've implemented a number of strategies for those let's call them potentially naysayers those that don't feel like they need to be part of the solution prioritization from the top. Our OC are embedded as executive sponsors in every core DEI initiative. We've got seven centers of excellence. Each of us has a member of the OC as part of our steering committee. Um, dedicated resources on our side. So while it is everyone's responsibility, 
we have teams of people that ensure that it's happening, that we're measuring it, we're creating process and structure and content and things that they can use to be more effective as advocates for DEI. And then we're doing a lot of storytelling because often you think those others, they have their issues, but I don't need to care. Often you're connected in some way to them. And by telling stories, you get to better connect with those others and the experiences they're living. And it becomes a little bit more personal and it gets you to have a more vested interest in helping. Stephen, I'll start with you next. Where have you possibly experienced the most resistance to D and I, and how did you respond to it? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I, I think resistance is is a, a part of life, and I think it's a part of um, you know just the the business cycle as well, right? I mean, if if, if folks have children or nieces or nephews, uh, as they grow, you see that there's a resistance to that change, uh, or there's a resistance to take direction, um, because you, you you get to a place where you feel like you know it all, right? And then uh, as you become an adult, um, you you look back and say, gosh, I wish I could be 10 again and just listen to what my mom or dad or aunt or uncle said because uh, there were no bills there were no you're like life was so much easier when I when I really knew and so you know I, and I use that analogy to um, because people grow up knowing what they know right they they have this you know information that's available to them and you know oftentimes the foundation in which we grow up you know sets the the long lasting pedigree of what we have uh, to use at our disposal at any point in time to, to give us information right if something's happening to a group of people that I am unfamiliar with because I'm unfamiliar with those people I checked in with my baseline my baseline doesn't have any information everything must be okay pull yourselves up by the, the bootstrap, whatever the, the other, whatever the scenario is, and you'll be okay. The reality is that it's not that cut and dry, right? It's not as black and white as it always seems. And so the resistance, even when we don't think we have it, sometimes it's there because bias is a part of all of us. And so even as a practitioner, right, I, I have to stay uh, in, in this constant state of learning because there's so many things that are changing. And what I don't ever want to create a culture of is saying, well, this person messed up. And so they're they're worthy of being exiled and canceled and, and they never get a redeeming quality ever you know they never get to have a redeeming quality ever again now there are egregious moments where that may be the case but oftentimes in the normal course of business if someone says something that they you know wholeheartedly don't understand then those are moments where we, we have coaching sessions as we think about for me as we think about the entire organization oftentimes that level of um of resistance comes in various ways right so usually when i'm talking to leaders about things sometimes it shows up as you got my full support doesn't mean i'm going to do anything but i won't stop you right and so sometimes i need them to do something in order to 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 to, um, to move the the agenda forward so again it's not a resistance that it will show up how you naturally or normally sometimes see resistance but sometimes it's just that I'm, i'll be here i'll be a body if you need me and other times just fight out resistance where, you know, we see people who who will turn things into situations where we're like, whoa, that's not what we're trying to achieve here. But now you've made it this situation that pits one group of people against another group of people. And so that sometimes is that outright resistance. And that happens throughout the entire organization as well. But I think for us is being able to spot both of those as being poten potentially harmful to the advancement of, of this work. Dr. Todd, your title alone, Senior Director of Global DEI for Microsoft, CBRE, the word global, that's basically where most businesses are at this point. We are a global industry. There are challenges when you merge different people together. What do you see has, been not, um, has not been warmly embraced and how have you approached those challenges within your company? Yeah, you know, you know, been in the market where we're, you know, in 90 plus countries, um, those are 90 different climates, right? And I think, you know, when you think about the global mindset, which has been shifting over the last 20 years um, in theory, but still trying to learn and practice, especially in the space of DNI, um, you know, we constantly are examining markets and climates in each individual geographical or region. Um, around where they're at and, you know, how, you know, definitions are defined and, you know, what does um, marginalized communities look like, you know, in, in that region. 
And so when you think about the challenge, uh, what we see in the business is, or what we see in, I would say in, in power constructs is that you, it's not a one size fit all. And you can't take what we do in the Americas or the US or the Southern region and apply it to the entire, uh, the entire global landscape. And I think, uh, you know, some, some companies and organizations are challenged with that. Um, and so it really come back to, you know, kind of the epitome and the practice of what we do every day and really allowing individuals to meet individuals where they're at, you know, and meet cultures where they're at, engage. And I think, you know, when you do BAU business as usual, you know, you're not, you're not in the mindset to, you know, stop tracks, to have those conversations, to listen. It's like, right. So we're, you know, based on your culture and where you're from, you know, how your behaviors is formed in storm as you come into the workplace really impact how DNI show up, you know, every day. And so I definitely see challenges with that. Um, and, and it's not one playbook either. So, you know, I would tell you, I've been, like I said, I've been in the profession for a while now, and no one has figured out one playbook for DNI that's global. If anyone said that they asked, <laughs> I would love to see the research and um and engage in the dialogue and but let me go to a step further because I, I think it was something as a descriptor earlier warmly embrace how how do you engage individuals who may do not warmly embrace the dni construct and etc um at first i would tell you that you know i i don't show up every day to change your mind that's not what I'm here to do. Uh, and I've learned that the time as a social study, study in social psychology, I understand that it's a difference. Uh, first of all, the time that it takes to change your mind. <laughs> and I don't have that time to really unpack that in a workplace day in the day to change your mind. So one of the things that we have shifted, and I've loved a lot of organizations who have taken this stance, is that we're not really focused so much on mindsets, but behaviors. Because I can't see how you think, but I can see how you behave. And so as an organization, if we are building competencies or we're building structures and operations to this is what we think, say, and do, it has, it has a shift. And so to me, I, you know, I hope you embrace, but I'm not here to, to, to assess your, your warms and fuzzies uh, because we got real work to do and people lives are being destroyed because I need you to feel comfortable. And so that's not where my energy is felt. Now I have understand and I do practice this. I do practice grace and space. And I do allow, you know, understanding that we all show up very differently. Um, and I also think, you know, building on what Brad said earlier, you know, it, it does start at the top because of power dynamics, but we also understand that let's not forget about that healthy middle, that belly of the organization, because the belly of the organization is why organizations are now, you know, putting out statements, you know, the belly of the community and the clients is why organizations are being held accountable. Um, not the top. <laughs> the top is still catching on. And the top is start, starting to say, yeah, you're right. We need to do the right thing. And to Stephen point, to land here, right, it's more than your commitment. Now is what, what are you doing to display your everyday behaviors whether you're in the boardroom or you know in the community or a first-time employee. So once again, I love this, you know, the conversation around the ecosystem approach. You're going to always have challenges with human behavior due to learned behavior and cultural norms and, um, and things of that place. But I believe as an organization, we have an opportunity to facilitate the culture we wish to see, right? We have the opportunity to build our economy and leave it better than we found it. And we cannot really expand on that opportunity as we do not address the systemic issues and the real disparities that's in our backyard. Well, I'm talking about the real backyard, not where we live, you know, not where <laughs> I'm talking about the backyard that we don't go and visit. And so we got to address those things in our own backyard, even before we start the conversation globally. We have um, invited the individuals who are watching this panel to submit their questions through the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. I'm gonna start with, his name is Joe Herrett. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Um, he's asked us several questions. So I'm gonna start with you, Stephen. And his first question is, what levels are DNI promoted in your company? Is it an initiative of hiring in a diverse atmosphere like HBCUs? 
Yeah, <clears throat> no, Joe, thanks for the question. You know, for us, it's it's promoted um, throughout our entire company, right? And so just, uh, just a little bit about us, you know, we have about 340,000 associates um, around the world. Um, and, you know, most of those associates are in store and uh, supply chain environments. Um, and then the, the, the balance of them are in corporate roles. And so when we think about even something like the pandemic that has you know, had this adverse impact on, um, on various communities for various reasons, whether it be health or financial reasons, um, it, we felt all of that because of the makeup and the demographic of our, of our population. Um, and so, you know, much like was said earlier, it, it starts at the top for us. Um, you know, our CEO Marvin R. Ellison is is one of a handful of Black uh, CEOs in the Fortune 500, and so he has uh, led with uh, and from a place of of that lens being on everything that we do. And so, um, you know, everything from performance reviews to, um, you know, how we are handling and how we handle social issues, uh, we look at it because it's uh, ingrained in a part of, right? There's not a separate step, right? We don't go through a performance review or a talent management process or training and then say, all right, let's send it all over to Steven and team now uh, to bless it with the diversity holy water, if you will, um, so that we can check the box it's this this is integrated into our process so it truly is from the top down right so uh from our initial postings right we've done everything like scrub language to make sure that we're being more inclusive there so that we're not leaning more uh towards one gender or another right so things that may not even show up or that you wouldn't even think to ask um are being part of and that that's your first initial step into our organization um and then things if you're a customer on the customer side how do we welcome uh our uh, welcome you into our stores one of the things my team just wrote out uh here just a couple of weeks ago uh was uh, vest for hard of hearing uh, and deaf associates, right? So, you know, we wear our red vest at Lowe's um, and, and we put on the back of those vests, listen, I'm hard of hearing, please tap me to communicate with me. Um, and then we have ways for those folks to communicate. If you think about, you know, even just a you know, six months ago, that was not an option. And people, you know, with, with face mask on or, or other, uh, re, if I'm behind you and trying to talk to you, you're hard of hearing, it's very difficult. Now you're thinking you're getting poor customer service. And so we're doing things like that, that for us, to the points that have been made are about improving the behaviors of, of, of our organization, right? So they're not about completely changing mindsets, although we do get some of those mindsets and I get you know, notes every once in a while to say, gosh, I really thought this way, but I see the benefit um, of this now. And so for us, it, it's all throughout the organization from um, the first time you step into our stores, we always like to say, every potential customer is a potential employee and every employee is a customer. And so we we have this full cycle of, of what we do uh, within that. And then of course, through our community partnerships, we partner with Hispanic serving institutions. We partner with uh, HBCUs, obviously predominantly white institutions. All of those are a part of our strategy when we think about uh, recruiting and promoting diversity within our company. Brad, I'm gonna continue Joe's question with you uh, from your vantage point and your link through JP Morgan Ch Chase, the levels of DNI promoted within the company. Is there an initiative there of making sure and evaluating a diverse group when promoting managers, directors, VPs from within? And will you be going to uh, business fairs to hire and look for diverse groups of applicants? So yes, 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 and yes, absolutely. Um, it, what's really important to us in the talent management process, and I think of talent management from acquisition through development through promotion and retention obviously because we don't want to lose good talent is diverse slates of opportunity so you know it starts on campuses and much like steven said we're on the hbcu campuses we're intentionally putting an additional focus on historically hispanic colleges I'm personally dealing with the key colleges that have large LGBT plus populations. And it sounds like that's all separate, but it's not because on the HBCUs where we do have large LGBT plus populations, we're there together so that we're ensuring that we have diverse slates of candidates coming into the firm. Even before we hire them, we're providing coaching and training at college campuses for financial literacy and things like job opportunities. Um, we look at that then through the life cycle of the talent management process. 
as we identify people for learning opportunities? Are those classes staffed in a diverse way? Have, have we really taken advantage of everything we live and breathe on the DEI agenda? And then when we have promotions come up, do we have diverse slates of employees being considered for promotions or even pre-promotion? There's a new opportunity that's a stretch. Do we have a diverse slate of candidates considered for that? And are we picking the best possible candidate for all of that? Like we are wholly invested in our people because our people are who run our business. And all of that will come down to, uh, are we thinking about best possible candidates and are we evaluating the slate from a very diverse perspective? So it's, it's integral and embedded in how we operate across all of our lines of business. Dr. Todd, um, this question comes from Michelle Roberthen. She wants to know what advice might you give for an organization just starting out with DEI initiatives or a DEI focus? Where do you start? Yeah, so um, that's, that's a great question. And it's, it's, it's quite often a question we get a lot, where to start, where to begin. Um, and so as I, as I said earlier, every organization is on different levels of maturity. Um, and from foundational to trying to build world-class, best-in-class, and even the world-class, best-in-class stride is understanding that you're still moving and evolving. Um, and so I would say, number one, as a practitioner, I know this is something that many organizations may not like to do, uh, but start with assessment. <laughs> start with assessment, qualitative and quantitative assessment. And let me tell you why that's so important. You can't solve something you don't know what the problem, you not identify the problem. It's like a diagnose. You can't treat something you haven't diagnosed. And so start with assessment, asking questions. It could be from a survey to a listening tour, to looking at the hard data of representation and understand the gaps throughout the talent life cycle, as Brad was uh, mentioning, um, and understand the opportunities, understand the product design design in the market. All of those things take time. What I've seen is the, and I would say not the wrong way, I would just say a challenging way that's not sustainable is when most organizations want to respond in immediate moment to have a quick solution. And it's a quick moment solution. And it feels good and you smile that you have accomplished. But we have a situation that's larger than the moment that we're still working every day to, uh, to really evolve and, and close those gaps. So I say, number one, my first advice is start with assessment, understand the landscape, and then go ahead and build a roadmap and a plan. And you have to have a conversation. You cannot do this by yourself. Um, so this is, it takes, it takes a village. It takes cross co collaborations with other departments, right? Um, this is not just an HR thing. This is not an EBRG or employer resource thing. And this is not, a DNI. This is not a black people thing. It's not a gay thing. It's a human thing. And we all have to work together across the lines to look at the assessment, build up initiatives, and then move forward and learn and develop along the way and understand that we celebrate small wins. We're going to need some coaching, some advisement. And last but not least, you have to work with people in the community who's already doing this work <laughs> um, every day, right? And so also collaborate not only within the walls of your company, but other nonprofits and other organizations like HBCU president. So we're, I work in commercial real estate part of Microsoft, and we're doing an HBCU roadshow. We're going to a lot of HBCUs. We're going to HSIs, suspended serving institutions. We're already, you know, of course, we work with the, the professional organizations, people who've been doing this work for years and years and years, and we're still challenged. So we all have to work together. So that would be my advice um, is start with assessment, build a roadmap, celebrate small wins, and continue and understand that this is a journey um, that we're all on. I want to remind everyone who's watching, we are taking Q&A questions um, at the bottom of your screen. You can type those in through the chat. Uh, and we're, because they're starting to stack up, guys, I'm just going to ask for a quick round robin answer to this one. This one comes from Gerald Beasley. He asked from each of you, describe the types of DEI training in your company and how do you assess its effectiveness? I'll start with you, Brad. Absolutely. So we have a boatload of DEI training, but it starts with inclusion. So we've developed a lot of great content around journey to inclusive teams, inclusive leadership, 
um, because we're a team-based organization and a lot of what we do is together and we need to be fully inclusive in our approach to that. So we've also done a, a, a unconscious bias training. What we've recently rolled out, which I'm so proud of, is a DEI learning portal. So in the portal, which is like super s- slick, you can log on to the portal as an individual consumer, as a team manager, as a group manager, and find curriculum and course content learning journeys that take you personally through the journeys or take your team through the journey. Something that can either be directed by a trainer or directed by yourself, uh, self-taught. So we, we've done a lot of work where we had a lot of disparate learning capabilities for this agenda, and we brought it all together into a unified place. And I think Stephen said it before, in a massively large institution, we've got close to 300,000 people, but we're trying to be consistent with the way we approach this and provide everybody the same opportunity to learn and be part of the agenda. Stephen, I'll let you go next. Yeah, our, our, our philosophy is, is very similar to that and in very similar types of um, uh, training. One of the things that we have implemented um, just at the end of the last year was uh, bite-sized learning, right? So that that is, you know, how do we include uh, something that is significant without it being overwhelming? I think all of us uh, at some point have set through a half day diversity training or a full day or, or multiple day training. And so we wanna take that experience and say, how do we give you the core pieces of that in seven to eight minutes that you can leave with something that's tangible, right? So I think going back to what Todd said earlier is, you know, how do we change the behavior? And if you have something that's tangible that fits into the business that you work in, whether that be customer facing supply chain or in the office, you then are able to say, okay, that was eight minutes. I'm not sure what I got, but then you find yourself creating the, the opportunity to, to, to imp, uh, apply what you learn in that seven or eight minutes versus it being this, you know, two or three day training and you're checking email on the side and you got to step out because there's a fire drill and all of those sorts of things. So that's, that's one thing that we have, that we've done more recently that, um, you know, for, you know, our, our focus groups that we use were, were really, uh, seem to be really impactful and, and we went forward with it. As far as the types of training, right? So unconscious bias is one um, I think most organizations lean into now. Um, we also have uh, cultural competency is a big one for us. Um, we have some initiatives at the, at the uh, enterprise level uh, around the type of customers we want to attract, um, the, the type of, of, of associates we want to attract. And so customers, so the, the competencies around cultures uh, is, a, is a big one for us when we think about how do we interact with people. Um, and then even within those subsets of people, um, how there are differences that, that you might see. Some people might stand farther away from you when in conversation. Some might stand closer to you. How do you still receive and give that same level of service um, it, and be able to recognize that this is just a cultural norm for this person and may not be disrespectful for me at all. Or, um, and so that's, that's another way that we do that as well. So those are probably, I would say, outside of the things that were already named or some additional things that we're adding into it and how we measure it as well. Um, so let me add, yeah, so how we measure it is we we have a, a yearly associate engagement survey. We're adding more pulse surveys to be able to, to test these things more frequently, um, but we ask specific questions around learning, development, our diversity culture, and then those are uh, aggregated into our, our leaders, and then we are able to, to action plan based on uh, based on that, and then we let that drive what the new sets of trainings will be year over year. And for those who are just joining us, I want to just read it, reiterate the question again, uh, Dr. Todd, before you answer it, and it came from Gerald Beasley. He said, describe the types of DEI training in your company, and how do you assess its effectiveness? Yeah, so, you know, the training is just as it's all up. And so it's the entire uh, entire spectrum of training um, from the leadership level to frontline level, um, from cultural, cultural training, um, talent, um, as well as connecting and evolving in the marketplace and our community engagement. And so we have specific skill-based training. We have, you know, from, as we heard on the panel so far, from a conscious bias to allyship, um, to just the skill set of how to be an inclusive leader. How do we measure effectiveness? We measure by the tie to the behavior. 
um, to the competencies, um, to the evaluations. We measure it how it should show up in the employee engagement and the climate scores. We measure how it shows up in representation. So, you know, one training is one thing, but practice is another. So uh, we should be able to see the, the outcome and the outputs of what the learning and development into the talent, culture, and marketplace. Um, and then last but not least, one of the things that, you know, we shifted and I, we work with a lot of organizations on this is, you know, empowering you to what to do beyond the training. <laughs> uh, because, you know, sometimes, human, you know, from a human perspective, it's like, I've done the training, check mark, I'm good, I'm good for the year, my DNI, i am ready. But some people do not know how to conceptualize the training and put it into motions. We see on the average of 16 days beyond a training, you forgot that what that training was until you're triggered for the right way or the wrong way. And then you may activate something you may have learned. And so I, what I will give anyone the advice, organization, practitioners, or just as an individual in the workplace, is then how can you do the follow-up, follow-through of any training um, to really assess its effectiveness, but also to sustain what you have learned. And Dr. Tom, uh, Joe Harrett has another question specifically for you to answer. He wants to know, do you think that self-identifying your ethnicity when applying to a job can have a negative effect when applying for higher tier positions, for example, management, director, VP and above? Yeah, so I think, you know, that's a, I wouldn't say it's a loaded question, but I would say that it's, it's different perspectives and how people show up in that space. Based on research, uh, we have we have seen that you know race um, as an indicator from resume review to promotions. We still see biases happen um, in the workplace when it comes to racial um, classifications um, from others. And so I I really do think that when you self identify, you have taken the opportunity to be your authentic self. Um, and so I, 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 I try to take a step back and I want you to take a step back or whoever listening is that and assess your cell phone questions. What does it matter to me if the perception, if I feel comfortable in my skin as whatever X, Y, Z, and I don't get the opportunity, does that, is that the place in this, in this, because of the indicators of my demographics, is that the place and culture I want to be in, right? So I, I, so I, I say to the next question is, if you're being your authentic whole self, right, and you bring your whole self to work, I think the perception piece I, I may struggle with because it's like, this is who I am. This is, I bring my whole self. This is a part of how I wish to show up. And so sometimes I don't really get into the mindset of perceptions of my identity because that's who I am. However, of course, depending on the com company and culture that you're in, we still see that as challenges where people are passed over opportunities. I mean, this I'm not going to sit up here and say that the research does not show that. People are passed over opportunities based on their gender, race, um, sexual orientation, et cetera. And so I really think you have to really assess your authentic self and how you want to show up and, and be proud um, of who you are. But I welcome my, my colleagues to weigh in on this. Um, you know, because I, I, I think to the next piece and I land with this is that, you know, I would ask where does race matter in that conversation of your promotion, right? So uh, if you are qualified and deserving of a promotion, you know, how much of the racial conversation matters and, and you get in that promotion. So I, I think that's the, another piece to unpack, right? Cause representation does matter, don't get me wrong. Um, and it does matter into how we show up in leadership, but I'll be interested into the panel. That'll be my perspective. I think it all depends. All depends, we're gonna leave it at that. I, I do have more questions we have to address. Uh, I'm gonna start with this one with Jalen Dolphin. Brad, I'll let you start with your response. He wants to know how DEI impacts the bottom line of a business. Have there been DEI incentives that you've implemented at your company, J. Morgan Chase, to improve the company's bottom line results without laying off employees? So, I mean, I, I absolutely think that DENI has a direct impact on bottom line results from many different perspectives. So I would say um, if we look at from a customer angle perspective, understanding our customers where they are and being able to meet them there helps 
our bottom line because we're going to be doing more business with customers in a way that they can understand better. And this covers like all different underrepresented groups. So being able to educate those that aren't financially literate and then help them to get their first loan and understand how to pay that loan off. Um, all of that helps both the customer and us. I think if you look at it from an internal, I think Dr. Jenkins was talking about internal and external and both being equally important. If you look then internally, your employees thrive when DEI um, is part of their culture and their way of working. And so I, I think that impacts the bottom line because you'll find when people become their true authentic selves, they want to stay in a company. They want to work harder. They're going to be more productive. They're going to be more efficient. And that will fuel the company's ability to do more, to earn more, to be better, to put out better products. Um, and then DEI could influence your product set too, right? So if you are selling things that resonate best with customers, and that could be any of our industries, and we represent many industries on the phone today, if your customers want your product because they can relate to it, then that's going to impact your bottom line. And we want our customers to buy our products because they're meaningful products to them, because they need those products for their everyday life. And Stephen, this next question comes from uh, Jaden Combs. And his question is, in college, and I'm not sure if this is DEI, it may be just personal, he wants to know. In college, did you know that this career was going to be the one that worked for years? And if not, when did you realize it? That's a good question, Jaden. Yeah, I, I had no idea in college. I mean, I think there was, um, and so it's funny because Todd and I go way back and we, we know each other from, from those days. But, um, you know, I actually started my career, my professional career in, in uh, student affairs. And so college student personnel, uh, I, I spent many years on a college campus. And I think it was, you know, you, you could definitely point to the dotted line where you're helping, you know, uh, students of all backgrounds to get the resources that they need to help them, uh, you know, whether you're recruiting them in and, and helping them stay there or helping them matriculate through, um, through the university. It, it was all part of, you know, I guess for me and probably for Todd, uh, this larger scheme for us, right? And so um, I had no idea coming out of college that this was even something that you could, you know, go and do. For me, it was really about helping other people. Um, and so, you know, my story starts, you know, with a single mother on the west side of Detroit, and, and I had people who helped me. And so I, I just felt like that was my gift of being able to give back. And so, um, you know, going in, in my last university job at Southern Methodist, Southern Methodist University. Um, I was, you know, helping to lead our um, our multicultural center there. I was working with athletics and I was doing a lot of the work that I really do today. Just we call it something different, right? You know, I was I was helping to retain people. I was helping to to get them to their goals. I was helping uh, and, and convincing parents that this was the place that they wanted to be, right? So you think about recruiting, you think about talent management, you think about uh, you know, performance management, you think about, you know, uh, uh, people getting promotions and going on to other places. I was doing all of those things at a college uh, in a college and a university setting um, that I'm doing today. But yeah, I had no idea coming out of college, um, this is what I wanted. You know, my major in undergrad was communications with the, with the uh, focus in ethnic studies. And then I went on and got a master's in, uh, in student college student personnel. And then I, I got another master's in organizational leadership. So, um, you know, I think it's one of those things where as much as you, you know, you have a, a plan for what you want to do, follow that plan, but then also be led to where you need to be. And then I think that was that was the thing for me that, that got me where I am. We have less than eight minutes. So I'm going to ask the panelists if you, you, the last and final questions we asked, if we could make them sort of quick so we can get as many of those questions that were submitted in. Uh, this one, I'll let you address Brad, is from Cesar Cedillos. He says, if we want our organizations to be reflective of our customer base, what should be the approach when the industry is largely homogeneous? For example, the construction industry, which is similar uh, makeup across the industry. Yeah, it's a tough question. Um, it leads to you being a lot more intentional about where you're sourcing your best candidates. And it's about broadening your scope of that sourcing. So, you know, I think about 
old JP Morgan and I've been here for a very long time. We had our set, like our, our college campuses we recruited on and that was it. And that was to your point, Sean, very homogeneous. And that is not how we should do business. And we can't ever represent our customers if that's how we're recruiting. 10 like Ivy League college campuses. So we broadened our scope and we we are meeting people where they are as students. And if they don't have what it takes for being JP Morgan Chase uh, professionals, we're educating them while still in college so that they can learn how to be productive, efficient and um, get developed. Uh, to be professionals at J.P. Morgan Chase. So we've been a lot more intentional about extending our sourcing and then giving those students what they need to be successful when they enter our doors. Stephen, uh, real quickly, Desiree Mills asks, what are some of the tactics you should start when it comes to being intentional with diverse recruiting? Um, so I think, you know, one of the tactics is, I think, as, as Todd said earlier, is understanding, you know, and, and understanding where you need to start, right? And so understanding, you know, the demographics of, of the workforce, are there opportunities, are there people already in positions who might just need some upskilling to help them advance uh, or to take on the next level role, right? So sometimes that doesn't have to always be this broad campaign outside the organization in order to do that. So I would say, understand the needs, understand what you have, and then settle those two things to realize what you truly need. And then I would I would say from there, starting at the top of the funnel, right? So when we talk about recruiting, the top of the funnel are anybody who would apply to this position, right? Are you using keywords and terms that are going to be inclusive for any person across different backgrounds to see this as a place or opportunity uh, for a job that they can apply for? So those are the two top things for me is making sure that your jobs speak to all people, but then doing the work internally to make sure that you're being equitable and that, and that people are getting the opportunity for advancement. Our next question is from Quentin Moffitt, and this is for you, Dr. Todd. If inclusion is active listening, and understanding and beginning with love, what are the competing priorities here? Yeah, great question, Quentin. Uh, I'll be very straight to the point. It's personal biases and agendas. Um, that's competing priorities. Power is competing priorities. Um, and business as usual, to which is once again, coming back to a personal agenda. Um, I think when people um, allow them, not allow themselves to, to blend into the process of how this don't only, you know, d and benefit themselves and others. Um, I think it's a, it's a whole nother type of behavior approach when you understand that concept and framework. And so on, uh, most people, what we see in, um, in research is they're just, lack of awareness. People are just, some people just don't know what they don't know. Um, and so I, I, I will just land there. Uh, personal agendas is usually what's competing. This is the final question for every one of our panelists. Uh, we have less than five minutes left. So please uh, try to maximize your work. Uh, the question is, are there long-term consequences for organizations that do not prioritize DEI? Brad, we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, I think it's actually kind of simple. At least at my firm, we believe that DEI is directly linked to our ability to do business. Our diverse workforce provides better representation for our diverse customer base. Diversity itself fuels innovation, creativity, productivity, and effectiveness. Prioritizing DEI allows our employees to be their best selves to do their best business. So the long-term consequences are we're stifled. We're not creative. We're not putting products out there that our customers need. It will impact the bottom line and we will lose customers as a result of it. With the right focus of investments in your people and your culture and your environment, your company will thrive, your people will thrive, and you will be in a better place all around um, to take it forward. Stephen, I'll ask you the same question. The long-term consequences for organizations that do not prioritize DEI. Yeah, I, I think we're seeing that that play out today, right? Is that, you know, if, if it's not a part of uh, the fabric of your organization, this generation 
um, is, is, is they're, they're smart, they're witty, they, they want, you know, sustainability as a part of, of coming into an organization. They want to know that you are doing the work in diversity spaces and social spaces, sustainability. And so um, people will stop choosing you. And if they stop choosing you to be employers, they will oftentimes stop choosing you um, to, to, to where they shop or where they do their business because they know that the power is in the dollar. And so, um, you know, I think we see that 100%. I think the answer is unequivocally yes. Um, it will have uh, a huge impact on on, uh, on on your business or your firm if you if you do not add DEI as a part of that work. And Dr. Todd Jenkins, last question for you: the same. Are there long term consequences from your vantage point for organizations that do not prioritize DEI? Yes, I, I, I don't need to I add on. I think it is well said. The economy will grow without you. <laughs> it's very simple. Uh, we, the, this generation, our generation, even, you know, the world is becoming more socially conscious. And so if your organization is not socially conscious and they want to continue to be unconscious, the world will wake up tomorrow and they will still be in yesterday. So if you don't prioritize this, you will be left behind. No one wants to become blockbuster, not if you want to be sustainable. I appreciate your time. Brad Bomell, Stephen Johnson, Dr. Todd Jenkins, and our wonderful host, the Dean of the College of Business at Louisiana Tech, Chris Martin. Thank you all for your incredible insight. Thanks for hosting this panel. Thank you for being honest, forthright. And just a reminder, the opinions that you shared were the opinions of yourself, not of your corporation, but I'm sure you reflect what the corporation believes and those tenets of their, their business philosophy. We wanna thank all of our guests today for joining us. And just a reminder here that recordings from each session will be loaded onto our community page. So please visit tinyurl.com slash LA Tech DEI 22 to view those. I hope you'll tune in at 10 a.m. Central Time for our next panel discussion featuring top female DEI executives. We appreciate your time and thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day and happy Black History Month. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks.